Okay, fantastic. So um, this is my kind of personal history, and I just wanted to give you this. So I started practice in 2001 in October, so it's like my 20th year. Um, that picture is kind of our marketing brochure that when I started practice, it was put together uh, by the Spine Institute, and it, it looks like me now with Botox, since I am from LA, but <laughs> I gotta say, I, I, I may look like that, but I definitely don't feel like that. So right after I started practice in 2002, we started the Protus Lumbar IDE. So I was corrupted with motion preservation at the beginning of my practice. And then in 2003, myself and my partner, Rick Delamar, replaced the first Protus C in the US. Now, this is what I would tell you was the ultimate fusion corruption. In 2004, I'm very early on in my practice, and we start the Denesis IDE. And usually when I talk about Denesis, most people in the audience go, oh, that's crazy. I took out so many of those. That's ridiculous. And I got to tell you, when we started this, my senior partner, Edgar Dawson, was like, this is crazy. This is bound to fail. I can't believe we're doing this. This makes no sense to me. But we did it anyway for some reason. I don't even know why. But what's fascinating is, is that it worked. And, you know, I mean, definitely there were problems with it being, you know, kind of indicated for fusion and the broad indication, it's overuse. But I will tell you, if you were strict to the ID indications, this absolutely worked. And I'm following patients now after 10 years of denesis. And, it, and it's incredible, because the level we place the denesis is so well preserved. And I haven't had to revise one besides doing the adjacent level. And then when you have to go back and do the adjacent level, you got to take this thing apart. And you're like, oh my god, this is just way too hard. So, um, But it is pretty fascinating. So I can just tell you that the long-term results, and unfortunately, they never really published this data. But when you looked at it versus the control, it really performed quite well, and the control was a posterior lateral fusion. And if you looked at range of motion, Denesis was not a motion preservation device. It was called dynamic stabilization. The idea was really to mitigate the biologic demands of fusion. So it was a way of stabilizing the segment and mitigating the biologic demands of fusion. But really what you're trying to do with the, st the stabilization is you're trying to bring longevity to the decompression, because we know that the decompression is the primary driver. And so the reason we do fusion is, is just to bring longevity to the decompression, right? So for posterior motion preservation, it is not dark disc disease. It is not axial back pain. You heard from our previous speaker, Ken, it's all about this condition. Okay, it's really degenerative spondylolisthesis with stenosis. That's posterior motion preservation. Okay, it's leg pain greater than back pain, stenosis. And why do we? Why are we doing this? Because this is the majority of fusions that we're doing. Three hundred thousand annual fusions. Half of those. Half of those are being done for basically this population. So the target population is the largest, okay? So there is a place for posterior motion preservation if we can figure out how to do it. Now, this was already brought up, okay? So these are the clinical trials looking at Basically, if you have spondylolisthesis, do you just do a decompression or do a decompression infusion? And our previous speaker brought up the first two trials, one favoring decompression, one favoring fusion, okay? But I will say the one that favors fusion does show an increase in adjacent level surgery at four years versus those with a decompression. Now, to break this tie, what he didn't mention, there was a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine in August of this year. Very modern technique. So the decompression wasn't a full laminectomy. The decompression was an MIS decompression or a laminotomy. And the fusion wasn't a posterior lateral fusion. The fusion was basically inner body fusions, which is most prominent today. And when you looked at this trial, it favored the decompression. So the fusion did not have any benefit. Now, this is the problem. So I've been at this game for 20 years, okay? And you see, when I mentioned the stenosis with spondylolisthesis, and we talked to a group of spine surgeons who have been at it for 20 years plus, is divided. You know, it's almost like, you know, the left and the right, right? And it's really interesting. So why, after 20 years, do we not have a consensus? Half the group is saying decompression, half the group is saying decompression and fusion. And obviously, the fusion group drives cost, definitely drives morbidity. Okay, now after 20 years, if we really knew what we were doing, this is what would happen. We would develop a consensus. 
The most common condition, the foundation of spinal fusion, degenerative spondylolisthesis, and still we don't have a consensus of treatment, okay? And this is why I think payers are kind of doubtful and the consumer, our patients are doubtful of fusion because we don't have a consensus. So the idea is, is that what is that consensus procedure? It's lacking. Maybe we need something that we would all kind of get behind that doesn't have the morbidity of fusion. And so if you really look at that, this is not, you know, this has been, um, this has been heavily invested in. We just had a market crash in 2008. But in 2008, there were probably $7 billion of private equity capital in 85 technologies, 85 companies looking at this solution for the largest target population. So these are some of the history. These are spinous process-based posterior stabilization. Wallace device, DM device, XStop, and then CoFlex. And I would say, have, being a participant in the CoFlex IDE, it actually is a pretty good device. When you look at it for that target population, so these patients were randomized between getting CoFlex or a posterior lateral fusion and decompression. And completely different operations, right? But what's fascinating is, is when you look at the five-year results, they're about the same. Same amount of revisions, okay? So I'm not sure what that's telling you. Maybe a fusion doesn't do that much, okay? It probably does say that. It's probably the decompression is the premium. The effect size of the decompression is the greatest, and all we're trying to buy is longevity of the decompression, whether it's with a fusion or something else. So this kind of distracted the foramen, okay? That was the idea of buying longevity with the decompression. This is a Lemiflex. So this is in current clinical trials. This trial is done for, okay? So it's the enrollment phase is over. They're collecting their follow-up. And I love showing clinical trials or devices that were developed by surgeons. This is from Todd Alman. So he developed this device. He's at Stanford. It was his passion. And his whole idea was, let's put a tension band around the laminotomy to engage the facets. So all of these, you have to do the decompression. So these are all manual decompressions first. And then the idea is, Let's engage the facets to get some biomechanical stability and bring longevity to the decompression. So very, very simple. These are just some graph curves of motion. So if you do a decompression and destabilization procedure, you see this graph going more superior. The intact is blue. And then if you put a decompression with the Limiflex, you bring it back to the intact spine. That's a whole idea, right? So it's increasing the longevity of the decompression with this dynamic stabilization device. So this is the IDA trial, it's 315 patients. It was randomized to TLIF. What's interesting about this IDA trial is, is there are two concurrent, uh, two concurrent arms. So as an investigator, I only enrolled Limiflex, okay? So I only did the decompression with the tension band. Another group did all the fusions. It's just a case example, this is at three years. Now I'm seeing my patients at three years and I gotta tell you, it's pretty effective. I'm not really sure if it's the Limiflex or if it's just the decompression, right? It's really the decompression that's effective. The Limiflex, I'm just trying to buy longevity of that decompression. And so obviously when you look at length of stay, EBL, it's, it's gonna favor the Limiflex. These were all done as an outpatient. The average age is in the 70s. So these are Medicare population that I'm doing as an outpatient versus the TLIF, the average age is still in the 70s, but they're staying three days in the hospital. So definitely a difference in morbidity. Obviously the results of six months show demonstrable good effect with the decompression, as you would expect. And so I'm gonna switch gears now and just kind of talk about where we are with pedicle-based dynamic stabilization. So I've showed you the denesis. I've showed you how the denesis works in this target population, which is degenerative spondylolisthesis with stenosis. These are some of the other devices that were used in the past. This is N-Spine, Stabilimax, and Agile for Medtronic. And all these are off the market now. Some failed early, okay? And I think you know the failures probably uh, hurt the industry and hurt this technology. Also, just the broad use of indication, okay? So these were used for back pain and other things which they probably shouldn't have been used for. And I think that also killed the technology, okay? But the idea is pretty simple. Like, even if it fails, it's a mechanical failure, so maybe we need to redesign the device. I don't think the concept is bad. Trying to bring longevity to the decompression without a fusion, but something else, okay? I wanna also 
show you this technology. This is a posterior motion-based technology. And like I said, I love surgeons who have, you know, put their blood, sweat, and tears. This is actually invented by Todd. Oh, sorry. Um, this is by uh, Greg Anderson from Jefferson. Okay. And so fascinating idea. I think this is totally out of the box. I, when I saw this, I was like, this is amazing. Pedicle lengthening osteotomy. Okay. What you don't see is there's a step in between that screw as it splits that you actually place a blade and you take a radial saw and you cut the base of the pedicle under flora. I know it sounds crazy, but actually I got to say it's it was, what was demonstrated to me, it looked pretty safe. So that's it. So you see the picture on the right, you see the pedicle lengthened and you see the canal being larger. That's a whole idea. So this is how it's done. Degenerative spondy with stenosis, all percutaneous. You put two screws above, two screws below, put the radial saw in, and then lengthen the pedicle. Okay. Now, if you don't know, this is kind of distraction osteogenesis. Orthopedic surgeons would know this. You basically lengthen the pedicle. You have something stabilizing it, and you will regrow that bone. Okay. It's the same kind of concept that we do limb lengthening with. So these are some other concepts. These are more PCOs, posterior column osteotomy type of devices, okay? Not for really back pain, for degenerative spondylolisthesis with stenosis, largest target population. We've heard about premium spine. The other two on the left are TFAST and uh, Arcadia. These are also facet replacements. The one on the top left is flexu spine, kind of a 360 replacement, both posterior and anterior column. Now, uh, we heard about premium spine. This was shown by Jack. This is from Balance Back, and this has currently started their IDE. Pretty interesting concept, okay? It's a PCO. They're going to take out both facets, so you do a wide decompression, right? And they're going to stabilize that posterior column all through the anterior column. And they do that by these two ball and socket joints placed side by side. And the whole idea, I think their key step is they do a superior pedicle osteotomy to get this, the size of this device in. So even though the disc is collapsed or maybe lordotic, you basically shave off the superior side of the pedicle, okay, of the inferior vertebral body, so you can insert this neutral prosthesis in. So this is the idea. You can see you put bilateral implants, and those bilateral ball and sockets are supposed to take the shear stress as you have removed the facet joints. So you remove the facet joints, you place two of these ball joint sockets in, and they really take the place of the facet joints themselves. So this is just an example. Oh, I don't have the, okay. So they have started um, a USIDE. Um, I think this is one of the older talks. I had a nice animation for you, which I don't have. Um, I can tell you that you know this is what you've seen or heard about for patients that have gone to the Cayman Islands. Uh, they have about 83 patients that they reported on. And I can just tell you, if you look at this versus a T-lift control, Again, very similar results because the decompression is driving the results, right? The decompression is driving the outcome. And this procedure, you do a large decompression, okay? So it's going to show the same effect, okay? The idea is, is that can you, can you basically buy that longevity and will these joints hold? So in summary, I think posterior stabilization or posterior motion preservation isn't axial back pain. Okay. It's the largest target population that we treat today. It's the 65-year-old. It's the 70-year-old that has degenerative spondylolisthesis that typically we may fuse. And what the patients see, oh, if you fuse this, I'm going to be back. It's that fusion cascade. And the idea is, is that to stop the fusion cascade by preserving motion. I think for us, we have no consensus solution. I mean, we're still divided between decompression or decompression and fusion. And we need to find a solution that we can all get behind. And then obviously, I think the, the greater difficulty is, is that we've seen technologies fail because of reimbursement. And I'm not really sure how we're going to tackle this, right? Because I think one of the challenges of CoFlex is really the reimbursement of CoFlex. And so I think that that's going to be another future challenge for us as well. But that's my talk. Thank you very much. Hey, just a, a question. You know, we, we've kind of gone towards less and less tissue disruption, and yet some of these were significant uh, tissue resection. And 
and iatrogenic destabilization, and then we're relying on this device to restore that. I think it's just a, that's a big bump for a lot of surgeons to get over as a leap of faith. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I completely agree. Because, you know, the, the next question everybody always asks, and, and it wasn't really asked for the, um, the, the Kent for premium spine, is what's the revision for these things, right? So if you're doing a tension band or you're doing something like this or you're keeping the facet joints in, you know, it's a more simple revision, right? You put pedicle screws in, you're going to do so, you're going to do your standard fusion, right? I think, you know, I think the challenge with the kind of PCO types device, the posterior column osteotomy type of devices where you're removing the facets, the advantage is you're probably going to get the best decompression ever, right? I mean, you know, that level as far as your decompression is concerned is done. But, you know, it is kind of like is can we design something mechanically stable enough to withstand that shear for the long term, and I think studies will have to show. And then, you know, really what happens if they fail? What really is the revision strategy? And I think that really hasn't been borne out yet, right? So I completely agree. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. It was great.